case that's not clear, <laughs> we are starting a series today that we are simply titling The Good Life, which we have stolen from Randy Alcorn's book, which has a slightly longer title called Giving is the Good Life. Some of you have been in uh, life groups that have started the Generosity Series, or maybe you joined us on Thursday evenings uh, where we had an open house and we were working through some of the material together over here as well. And so please don't be surprised if you do hear some uh, repetition. Again, we believe repetition is one of the keys to learning, but I'm hoping that there will be uh, a lot that is fresh and more personalized and more applied to us today to keep it very, very simple simple. Uh, the title of the message is really, for Josh's sake, really. Is it really? When we talk about the good life, I think that it is reasonable, if not wise, to stop and ask the question, is it really? Is generosity, is giving truly a part of what leads to the good life? Now, I do have an opinion about that, and I'm going to try and communicate that. Uh, I think that Jesus addressed this in various forms, and so did a lot of the New Testament writers. Perhaps the most uh, well-known passage is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, just the last part of the verse, where Jesus is being quoted as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That word blessed in the Greek is, is makarios, and it basically is referring to Happy, being happy. Now think about that. We are happier giving than receiving. I don't know about you, but that has often not been true. Like, I don't mind receiving. I've got to tell you, I'm okay. I'm okay with, uh, with, with receiving people's kindness and generosity. And even as Sue was, was asking us to reflect earlier in the communion, um, and, and I was thinking back to a, to a gift that was very meaningful to me. I, I mean, it blessed me. Not, and I don't mean in a superficial way, I just mean it, it really, it made me feel like someone noticed, someone was thinking of me, someone cared, someone put in time and effort. Um, it, make no mistake, it is, I think that is also nice to receive, especially when it is generous. And if we're honest, okay, forget about we, me, if I'm honest, there have been many times in my life where I have given and it hasn't felt happy. It's actually felt like... Uh, okay, I tick the box, or okay, like, like I can get the person away from me now, at least I've got them off my back, or, or I can feel obliged. Um, there, 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 are various, there are various motives over the years as to why I have given. And the truth is that there have been many times where I have given, but without being generous. And so I want to be very clear that throughout this series, even though you might hear the term giving, I, I want to be careful because in the English language, I, I, think, I think it can mean one thing technically because we're giving, but I don't think it guarantees that we're being generous. And I think that is generosity. So if we can tap into a, a heart that actually appreciates God and His kindness and His provision and what we do have, not what we don't have, and, and we hold on to it loosely, I think that we can grow, and it is a journey, so relax, we can grow in generosity so that giving, when we do it, actually does become a heart attitude. It actually does become something that is sincere from us. So if you were to, to, to put the word happy into that verse, in the Good News uh, translation, it would say there is more happiness in giving than receiving. Or the message version says you're far happier giving than getting. Hence my question, really? Anyone agree that that's a valid question? Anyone agree that it can feel a lot happier being on the receiving end sometimes? Who would feel deeply grieved if you won the lottery today? <laughs> or someone gave you a new car or moved you into a, you know, a, 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 whatever your living circumstances are, like a, you know, scaled up. Would anyone feel deeply saddened by this. I, I mean, I think you're a bit weird if, if that were to make you sad. Unless, of course, there were strings attached, which, truth be told, there are often a lot of strings attached to giving, yeah. which stops it from being generous. And again, I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of people giving, but you feel like there's some obligation in response. That's not generosity. And truth be told, that's not a gift. That's a transaction. 
I do, however, believe that it is possible to grow in a heart of generosity that trusts God, recognizes his goodness, his faithfulness, his kindness, his provision, and, and can appreciate what we do have. We trust him with what we don't, and we hold loosely, in a sense, not reckless. There's a difference between being reckless and holding loosely, as in God can pry it out of our hands. He can prompt us. He can, he can invite us to do something. Holding onto things loosely, I think that as we live an increasingly generous life, I do think that it's a happier life. And for some of us, that word might sound superficial, but I think that there is more joy. I think there is more peace. I don't think that there is the same level of joy and peace and love attached to greed and stinginess. I think that that might bring pleasure in the moment, but I don't think that it brings a depth of joy and love and peace. Some of you are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I believe that the first three verses tell us that you can give without loving. And then the next four verses tell us that we can love without, sorry, that we cannot love without giving. It is possible to give. In fact, the first three verses talks about how you can, you can give everything you have to the poor. It also says you can know all things, you know, prophesy, speak in heavenly languages. You can do all of these things, but if it's not motivated by love, it's nothing. It's a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. In other words, it's noisy. That's why it's possible to give, in inverted commas, and, and it actually and it actually be painful for somebody on the receiving end because, because you feel like this isn't motivated by love. However, you cannot truly love without being generous. Verse 4 goes on to say, love is patient. That's generous. When everything in you wants to react and you're choosing to be patient, that's generous. Love is kind. That is generous. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It, it hopes for the best, believes the best. It, it, deli- it does not delight in evil. You cannot... Love without giving, but you can give without loving. Now, there, there's lots in, in Scripture, and we'll, we'll make reference to them over the next few weeks, but for those of you that care, and for what it's worth, I care. Like, I appreciate the fact that more and more modern-day research and science um, actually catches up with and agrees with a lot in Scripture. Now, again, for some of you, that doesn't matter, and, and that's fine. Please don't judge those of us for whom it does matter, and especially for people that are on a journey of exploration in their faith journey where they are trying to reconcile and, and, and discover God for who he is. But there is plenty of research, modern day research, that shows that people that are generous are actually more joyful, more content, they're happier, healthier, have lower levels of depression and anxiety, are more interested in personal growth, they have better relationships, they have a higher life expectancy, they laugh more. Social scientists Hillary Davidson and Christian Smith in their book, The Paradox of Generosity, said that people rightly say that money cannot buy happiness, but money and happiness are still related in a curious way. Happiness can be the result not of spending more money on yourself, but rather of giving money away to others. The data examined here show this to be not simply a nice idea, but a social scientific fact. In other words, in other words, both the Bible and, and a lot of research, and, and when I say research, I don't have the time to unpack all the different sources, but plenty of university-level PhD professors on a global scale that have done research into hope, into grit, into happiness, they, they, they put together data that indicates that people that are living for a purpose, in other words, something beyond themselves, are happier. They have more resilience. They have more tenacity. Some of you be familiar with Viktor Frankl and his book, uh, In Search of Meaning. A concentration camp Holocaust survivor who was a psychologist before he went into the concentration camps. But, But one of the most significant findings that he, that he came away from that traumatic, and, and when I say traumatic, I mean on a level that is seldom compared 
He came away with a conviction that people that have a purpose, people that have a sense of meaning, can persevere, can push through, are more resilient, can come out the other side. Some of you are familiar with the term ikigai, which is a Japanese term. Um, if, you've ever, if you've ever researched or watched things to do with the blue zones in the world, you know, people that live to 100 and beyond, um, one, of the, one of the common threads is people that are living with a purpose. So they're living beyond themselves. Now, let's go back to Jesus for a moment. He said some interesting stuff, which some of you are familiar with, perhaps to a fault, and others, for others this might be brand new. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he is instructing through what is famously known as the Sermon on the Mount, the following. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy it, and thieves do not break in and steal. By the way, some, some scholars have argued that, that, that the term there, heaven, so, so, so what is being described as earth and what is being described as heaven is most likely being described as focusing on what is temporal and that which is eternal. Then Jesus goes on to make what is one of his more memorable quotes. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Jesus is saying that there is a connection between our hearts and our treasure. And it's not the one that we assume. I don't know about you, but for me, it would make common sense. It would, it would, it would make more sense to me to say that, that where my heart is, so what I care about, there my treasure will go. And, and I think that you could make a strong case for that. But Jesus is saying that actually where I, where I prioritize my treasure, that's where my heart is going to follow and again, many of us would agree that the more we are spending on something, the more our concern goes towards that. The more our minds, our, our, our energy, our thoughts, our worries can go towards that. He goes on to say what has been a very strange statement, something that, that I have not, that I didn't find easy to understand in the early years. He says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. It sounds great, but I'm like, what does that mean? I'm, I tend to be more, more literal than metaphorical, so I'm like, I get it, but I don't. He goes on to say, when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Now, again, for those of you that haven't done the series with us, we haven't gotten to this part in, in the practice yet, scholars, and, and, and again, I'm specifically quoting New Testament scholars with a specialty in the book of Matthew. So, so that's the bulk of what they have studied and come to understand. They argue that, that, again, this is all metaphorical language, and the idea of having a healthy eye is actually having a generous eye or a generous worldview, a generous perspective. And I don't think it, he's meaning that it's literally going to make your body better, although I think that that can be a healthy you know, side benefit, but I, think, but I think that he's saying that to live with a, with a generous worldview, with, without a scarcity mentality, it actually makes our whole lives healthier. And then conversely, to live with an eye that is unhealthy, he's referring to a worldview or perspective that is stingy, greedy, or jealous. And so then it actually fills our lives with darkness. My hope and my prayer is that something will sink in beyond some of the natural sort of rebuttals and and concerns and cautions. And, and let me just let me just start off by saying as a disclaimer, you don't have to give anything. And you don't have to give anything to the church. This isn't a ploy to milk you. I genuinely believe that Jesus is inviting and encouraging 2,000 years ago, his listeners, and then all of us that have been able to read his words since then, that, that, that there is a way to life that actually leads to life. An abundant life. A life to the full. A life that is growing in love and joy. 
and peace. And I think that it starts with an attitude towards abundance, an attitude towards God is, I mean, we sang about it this morning, a good God, a kind God. Again, when Sue was asking us to reflect during communion, I was just thinking back to where I was when, when I felt like God got my attention and I turned to him. And I'm like, I was unworthy. I was, I was drifting away. I wasn't looking for him. I mean, you could argue that I was underneath it all, but, but I wasn't consciously looking for God. It is nothing but grace. Sue and I were discussing something yesterday or the day before, just, just a, a shift that's taken place in our lives recently. And, and again, we're just saying it's the kindness of God. It's just the great, like in other words, it's not, it's not, it's not deserved. And I think that the more we are able to recognize the kindness and the goodness of God, I think the more we will live with a life that is less greedy, less stingy, not tight-fisted, not hard-hearted. And then he goes on to say another very famously quoted verse. Verse 24 says, no one can serve two masters. He doesn't say it's not a good idea. He doesn't say it'll be hard. He says it's impossible. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. In the New International Version, it says you cannot serve both God and money. In the Message Version, it says you can't worship God and money both. And for those of you that have been around for a very long time, if you know this term, it means you've been in church for a long time. In some of the slightly older English translations, it would actually use the word mammon instead of money. And in some translations, it was actually capitalized. And a lot of scholars believe that it's because Jesus was actually identifying a power behind money, the, a, a, a spiritual force, a demonic power behind, behind money when we make it our God, when we make it our small g God, and when we are worshiping it and, and putting our hope and our faith in it to bring contentment, peace, joy, provision, which... To be fair, it makes a lot of sense because it can do a lot. But it's all about the relationship that we have to money. Two very simple and quick points that I want to leave you with today. The first is that the good life depends on how we view God. This is not a series that's going to be cracking the whip and beating you to have to do a, a copy and paste or cut and paste or one size fits all type of thing. This, it's, it's not. I cannot emphasize strongly enough how much we want something for you how how and for me by the way like I want to I want to increasingly catch God's heart towards living a generous life living beyond myself on an increasing measure but the way to true to the good life truly and by the way when philosophers talk about the, the good life they are referring to for the most part a sense of happiness contentment Fulfillment. In Christian terms, which I think are more meaningful because it's deeper, joy, peace. So the good life depends, number one, on how we view God. Do we see God as our Father and our provider? Do I see myself as a child? Do I see all of life as a gift? And we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more in a couple of weeks. But I just, want to, I just want to point out for a moment that if, if you find generosity, and generosity takes on many different forms. It's relational. It's our gifting. It's our time and energy. It is, it is um, listening to someone, being patient, holding space with someone, grieving with someone. And it is also material. And for some people, they can give materially without being generous. For someone else, they might not be able to do much materially, but they're able to give of themselves and of their gifts, of their talents, of their time, of their compassion. I think to carry someone in prayer is an act of generosity. Truly. I think when you commit to praying for someone, which by the way, if you ever say to someone, I'm going to pray for you, I want to suggest that that's one of those things you say, that you should put extra things into place to make sure you're doing it. Because if I was God, I'd be like, really? Because I'm watching. And so I'm just saying it's seldom that I will tell someone I'll pray for them unless I do it immediately or if I don't put a reminder onto my phone to go off. 
in some cases daily. But it takes time and energy to, th- to pray. But if we see him as the kindest person we'll ever meet, as the most generous person, not a stingy, greedy, transactional, difficult father. I'm saying we, I can get you to do things on a behavioral level without anything changing in your heart. And that would be religion. And that's not what God's inviting us to. That's why, in fact, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees when he said, you tithe even to the tiniest little bit of your, of your herbs and spices. In other words, you're getting the behavior technically correct, but you actually are ignoring the more important things, which is mercy and justice. And I was just saying, there's a heart issue here. I think when he challenged, in fact, he didn't even challenge. He invited the rich young ruler, those of you that are familiar with the story, to sell all of his possessions and to give it to the poor and to follow him. I don't think that he was setting a new standard for all Christians. I think he was, he was narrowing in on the one thing that was at the center of this young man's heart that was in the way of him actually trusting God as he's generous father. So that passage that we were reading in Matthew 6, literally you just continue and we see a little bit more of who God is and how we can view him. Verse 25 says, that is why I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink, enough clothes to wear. Again, just to be honest, there are times where I'm like, "Ah, God, I feel like there's a bit of a gap between Jesus' words and my reality. And so I need help in closing that. Isn't life more than food? Yeah, yeah. And your body more than clothing? Sure, but I don't want to be naked. Look at the birds. I think about this. Again, we need to read, like we need to pay attention to what we're reading. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food, which again is not Jesus saying, don't do anything. Be lazy. Don't sow, reap, you know, make provision. He's not saying that. He's He's just saying the birds. And aren't they far more, uh, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And then here's the point that Jesus is making. Aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? He's like, just look at the birds. God provides for them. Aren't you, the only point Jesus is making is aren't you more valuable? That's how we view God. Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, which I can't say I've done a lot of, and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully about flowers, I hope you're catching this. If God cares about flowers, that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? I just, I think all Jesus is trying to say is, we have a good father. And if we can see him as a deeply, deeply generous person, for God, generosity is not a discipline, it's a delight. It's not him putting on a facade, it's him revealing who he is. He is generous. God loved, John 3, 16, God gave. God loved, God forgave. Forgiveness is an act of generosity, as God give in the word. It is an act of generosity. Our view towards God really, really matters. And I think one of the examples that John McComber made that, that, that stuck with me was how was how someone, two people can be living in the exact same circumstances. Same income, live on the same street, same economic responsibilities, same, like everything's the same. Same income, same responsibilities. And yet live with two very different mindsets. That of scarcity, that of abundance. And I'm sure you've heard this repeated many, many, many times, but but many, many uh, surveys have shown that when people are asked how much is enough, pretty much the answer is always just a little bit more. It's only like 10% more than what they're making currently. John D. Rockefeller, who was the richest man in the world at the time when a journalist asked him how much is enough, he was the richest man in the world. His response was just a little bit more. A movie was made about him and his unwillingness to pay the ransom for his grandson. He goes on. Verse 31 to say, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Again, I don't think Jesus is encouraging recklessness. I think he's saying, I think there's a difference between stewardship and 
like an anxious worrying constantly about those things that are out of our control where we've done what we can and we're viewing God in an appropriate way. Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And some of you are for the first time ever wanting to shout amen. Today's worries are enough for today. Let me, let me not even think about tomorrow. So if you want to put this simply, and I think this is the gospel, and I think that this is what, sh- what invites us to generosity, is that when, when it comes to the love of God, we, number one, we receive his love. We, we don't, it doesn't start with us giving ours. It starts with us receiving God's love, which invites us to humility. Secondly, we respond to God's love, which is actually an attitude of gratitude. It's where we, it's where we are grateful for your love. And, and so as a response, I'm loving God back. And then thirdly, we reflect God's love, which speaks of compassion. We receive his love, we respond to that love, and we reflect that love. You want to know the answer to generosity? It it starts with God. It starts with gratitude. It's very hard to be deeply grateful and stingy at the same time. And again, I'm talking about any sphere of your life. It is very, in fact, I would argue it's impossible. I would argue that it's impossible to be deeply grateful, to to feel, just to feel great, just to feel like, yo, man, I don't deserve that. Which is, by the way, when you know it's a gift. So it's not transactional. But But to be grateful, you cannot be stingy at the same time. And I would argue that loving compassion is concerned about others to the point of action or generosity. So for us to love God is one thing. For us to love people, yeah, I just don't think, I think a deeply stingy Christian is an oxymoron in the sense of someone that, and I was just like opposite. We, we, I, I don't think we've had a revelation of God's love or grace if I have absolutely no compassion and unction towards serving, giving, loving, listening, praying, like anything else towards living beyond myself and as we keep maturing where there are less and less strings attached because make no mistake our our motives yo man I don't know if they're ever 100% pure maybe you can get to like 99% I don't know if I've ever gotten there but but even when you're motivated correctly then when the person's ungrateful it can be like yes like and then oh okay okay that reveals a little bit of my at least an angle at least an element of my of my motive. The second and final point is simply that the good life depends on where we store our treasure. So it's our view of God, and then it's where we store our treasure. And in this particular context, I do want to challenge you practically in terms of where you place your treasure, where you place what matters most to you. Going back to verse 19, Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth. Notice that he's not saying don't store up treasures. He doesn't have a problem with storage. He's just saying, don't let it be on those things that are temporal. Verse 20, store your treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in a steel. But then there's that interesting little verse, that like uncomfortable verse if you think about it. Where it's a little bit, you know when you just want to like keep reading? If you read your Bible, either you are very, 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 very close to being the fourth part of the Trinity, or you're in denial if you don't notice that there are some parts that you're like, like it's not even conscious, it's just, yeah, yeah, whatever, like I'm looking for something that I agree with. I'm looking, like, like let's, let's keep moving on, right? Any honest Christians in the building? Five of us, okay. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. So, so maybe there is something to be said for being intentional. Put another way, it's that, it's that old adage of choices lead, feelings follow. Now, that's not always true immediately. I'm not offering you any formulas or quick fixes or gimmicks. There are times where I make the right choice and my feeling doesn't follow for a long time. But if I keep making the right choice, I, I start 
experiencing that deeper peace and joy. So, so you could argue, is it the chicken or the egg? Like, is it, is it, okay, as I practice generosity, I become more generous? Or is it that I first wait to have a revelation of God and then I become more generous? Yes. I don't know. I think, I think, I think, I think that both are so closely connected that they're almost indistinguishable. Because even a prompt towards generosity is still the grace of God. Even the prompt to be disciplined in generosity is actually a prompt from God anyway. So there's just so much grace. But then there's also discipline. There's also a decision. There's also a commitment. So this is what I want to encourage you to do this week. This is the invitation. And it's not going to get much easier than this, just so you know. So please, for the love of everything holy, try and do this, okay? I want to encourage you this week simply to reflect and then to recognize. That's it. Reflect and to recognize. When I say reflect, I mean to be intentional about slowing down, carving out some time to just slow down, and hopefully more than once, to genuinely reflect on what God has done for you on where God has been kind to you, on where God has provided for you. Everything in you might, might be tempted towards a long list of what you think he hasn't done and hasn't provided and what you need right now. I'm gonna ask you to fight that temptation for now and just to focus on reflecting on God's kindness and his generosity. And then the second thing is to recognize. Ask God to help you recognize opportunities to be generous this week. Notice I'm not telling you to be generous. I'm not telling you that you have to do anything with it. I'm just encouraging you to ask God to give you a healthy eye. Yeah. To help you to see, before anything else, to see through a healthy lens. To see with a little bit more of an abundant mindset as opposed to a scarcity mindset. To just, just each day, I'm encouraging you each day, and if, and if, and if even God doesn't want to meet with you first thing in the morning, then maybe last thing at night, I'm saying if you're that miserable and grumpy, you know, first thing in the morning, then maybe the last prayer you pray before you go to sleep at night, God, please help me in the next 24 hours to just recognize opportunities. You can even be really disciplined about not doing anything about them. That's okay. All I'm asking you to do is to ask God to help you to recognize. When you're at school tomorrow, when you're at home this afternoon, when you have the opportunity to do a chore or there's something that needs to be done and, and, and it's no one's responsibility and everyone's pretending like they don't see it or notice it or, or at work tomorrow or on the bus or in the traffic or whatever, just, just ask God to help you to recognize an opportunity to be generous, to be loving, to be kind, to be patient, to be self-controlled, to be gentle. God, help me to be generous. Before I pray, I want to ask you just to close your eyes for a moment.